up, everybody, and welcome to another championship edition of Nerdgasm. Uh, I am your host today, Brooklyn Vale. We have uh, the, I guess, it would be the usual suspects uh, in, in the final shares. We have uh, we have editor Tim Bracala for the reigning champion, uh, taking on one of the most annoying people in the community, Caleb Coho. He somehow got here. Uh, but before we get to our competitors, let's introduce our judges. Starting off with uh, that son of a bitch, Cody Newberry, the the the, the co commissioner, I guess the. I, I don't know one of the one of the one of the heads on the Mount Rushmore of nerdgasm, I guess you would say. Um, how do, how do you feel about today's match? Uh, I hope the competitors talk better than you do, um, but I think this is going to be a fantastic match. Uh, there's like seven of us that run nerdgasm, and I probably do the least. So um, I'm in a tough spot uh, because uh, one of my best friends is here, uh, Tim Bercala, um, and then there's Caleb. Um, I'm on call with Caleb at least like a couple hours a week, and if he loses, I can hear the I can. Well, you know, Cody, if you would have voted for me on that point, I would have been champion. Blah blah blah. Cody's in another championship match. Can he grab that gold ring, or can he just fall to the bottom of the pit yet again? Um, I don't know. We'll see. I also, I believe, making his nerdgasm judging judging debut, but no stranger to the fan debate community as it is. Uh, that is one Doug Castle. Doug, how do you feel today uh, getting your nerdgasm uh, feet wet uh, with the championship match? Uh, it's definitely going to be interesting. Definitely going to be a lot of fun. Uh, yeah, no, I'm excited uh, to be here. All right, uh, let's get into the minds of our competitors, starting off with the champion, Tim Bacala. Tim, uh, it, it has been said that you have not competed since August uh, when mm-hmm. the uh, when the, the rebranded inaugural championship was uh, was fought against uh, against your brother-in-law, one Hobbit, Robert Parker. Uh, yeah. How do you feel uh, going up against Caleb? Do you find this is an upgrade or a downgrade to your previous competitors? Uh, well, yeah, I don't know. Uh, I would get I, – I, I don't know. Upgrade or downgrade, I mean – Coho is always a downgrade, but um, no, I don't know. I'm nervous. I'm always nervous before a debate. I never take these lightly because it's not something like trivia where you can just like study, 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 and then like know that you're going to know every answer, right? Like it, it's very, uh, you have to adapt. So this will be interesting. I've never fought Caleb. I've watched all his videos, all, all of his fights um, in Nerdgasm, a couple outside of Nerdgasm to prep for this. So, um, I feel like I'm semi prepared, but we'll see who knows if I lose, I'll just, uh, I don't know. I'll just lock him out of the fandom dock and next season, the fandom will be interesting. (laughs) Lock him out of the fandom doc. Let's have that recorded there uh, for, uh, for video evidence, uh, and your challenger, uh, Caleb Coho, Caleb, uh, you had you had a rough round one uh, in, the, in the previous tournament in the form of inevitable finalist Robert Parker, uh, but then you got then you got your redemption shot at, at the form of, uh, of Jay Burns, somebody who also had a had a had a had a rough go rough go of things, uh, but you uh, you bet you beat him and you're here. How does it feel to finally face Tim? Um, this is my first debate title match ever, uh, so this is kind of cool. Uh, if Tim did. 10% of the amount of prep that he said he did, I'm fucked. Because <laughs> I, I have done about an hour's worth of prep for this. Uh, but I, I'm i going to try my hardest. I did, Tim deserves that. He deserves my best. And I'm going to try and give him uh, as much as I can uh, in the, tonight's debate. Um, and we'll see how it goes. Uh, I like these questions. I like the answers we both gave. It'll be fun. All right, so how it's going to work before the, before the match starts, uh, these guys submitted four uh, fandom categories for us to create questions from. Uh, then we gave them the questions, and they drafted their answers uh, accordingly. Uh, there will be four prep, four prep questions and three speed round questions. It is going to be a race to four points. Uh, for the prep questions, there is a one-minute opening, followed by five minutes of free form, and then a 45-second uh, closing arguments. Uh, two rules of this match are no filibustering, uh, as always, and no touching of the ha- hands of the sorry of the hair or face. Can't don't even remember my own catchphrase. But um, let's get right into it with question number one. Uh, we went into the realm of Doctor Who, uh, and your question is: What is the most underrated episode of Doctor Who? Uh, we are going to be starting off with Caleb Coho. You have one minute, and time is going to begin whenever you start talking. 
um, when we got into the Capaldi era, it was an era of Doctor Who where there was a lot of contention, a lot of uncertainty as to where we would go, if the new Doctor would be good, if Moffat could keep doing what he was doing without Matt Smith in the role. And uh, the first season was very shaky. Uh, it got very episode of the monster of the week sort of thing, and people hate that with Doctor Who when it gets too much like that. Um, and I think the episode that really broke us out of that mold was time heist. Uh, it put the doctor in a situation we've never seen him in before, uh, which the doctor being the smartest fictional character of all time up there with Sherlock Holmes, uh, not never being in the position of pulling off a bank heist actually surprises me. Putting him in the center of the most heavily guarded bank in the galaxy with a bunch of alien security measures that he has to figure out his way through is an interesting episode. And then you throw in the mystery of they don't know who hired them, they have no memory of why they're there and having to unravel the mystery of what they're actually trying to steal, who hired them, and then also trying to get through the bank is super exciting. Time Heist is easily the best episode of the Capaldi era, and it's super underrated. All right. Over to, uh, over to Tim for your, for your answer of what is the most underrated Doctor Who episode. <clears throat> um, when looking at the Capaldi era... Um, I kind of went through and thought about the seasons as a whole, and it's kind of remarkable how Capaldi just overall as a doctor just didn't um, have a lot of memorable episodes, but the few that are memorable um, are actually pretty fantastic. And so I went with um, Twice Upon a Time, which is actually his last episode as the doctor, because it's the first time that we actually kind of get to see Capaldi have any emotion whatsoever. He's kind of a more distant doctor, kind of a, a different one than Matt Smith, um, who Caleb mentioned. Um, they kind of went a different approach with Capaldi. So then when uh, we finally got towards the end of his final season, uh, you got a different side of him finally. And so I think that made twice upon a time really fun. Also, there's a lot of other cool stuff that happens in the episode I'll get into, but there's some guest appearances from other characters that we hadn't seen in a really long time. Makes the episode really fun. A nice send off um, for Capaldi as the doctor. All right. Excellent. All right, gentlemen, you know the drill. Five minutes of free form. Like I said, no filibustering. Uh, I will give you a one minute warning, but just, just ignore that and keep on going. Let's get it on. Okay. So, you picked Twice Upon a Time, and you picked a Regeneration episode. The Regeneration episodes are easily the most overrated of any Doctor Who. Every Regeneration episode is the one where you get all the quotes, the, oh no, we lost this Doctor, but yours is probably the worst Regeneration episode of the New Who era, because they brought back the first Doctor, but the first Doctor's been dead for 40 years, so we got an Impressionist to sort of do a, a mediocre impression of William Hartnell's Doctor, which brings the entire episode down a peg. Well, that, that's like saying that anytime any character is ever recast, that that means that that brings something down. That's definitely not true. Characters are recast all of the time in tons of media, and that doesn't do anything. Uh, David Bradley is excellent as that doctor, and him and Capaldi do a really good job back and forth. I want to touch on something you said in your opening. You said, oh, his, his season one, you know, it had a lot of blah, blah, blah of the week. Um, your episode is like episode five of that season. Yeah. There's no mold to break at that point. The first four episodes are like, yeah, sure. They're like thing of the week. Time heist is also thing of the week because the episode after it, they just go back to doing more stuff. It doesn't break the mold in any way. Sure. It's a fun, like heist episode, but at least my episode brought back someone, uh, an old character that we liked. It kind of was a fun way to like send off Capaldi different than other regeneration episodes we've seen. You brought back a character that should have never been brought back. That actor's been dead for so long and he left his stamp on the role so perfectly that by bringing him back, you're doing an entire disservice while trying to do fan service. It's the worst kind of fan service where there's no real point of bringing the first doctor back you could have easily brought back the fourth doctor the fifth doctor the sixth doctor any of these other doctors that are still alive and willing to come back and do this role and have that story still fulfilled the exact same way there's no real emotion and you said emotion by the way there's more emotion in the capaldi episodes heaven sent and hell bent from the previous season where we see more range out of him than in twice upon a time where he just is angry which he does better in heaven sent and hell bent you, okay but again like you're talking like bring back a fourth or a fifth doctor that's not the point of the episode the point of the episode though is kind of to show how far 
far the show has come at this point because this is like season nine at this point season 10 i believe so the fact that you're bringing back the first doctor it kind of it really does show like how far the show has come from beginning to this point your episode is unfortunately just another episode of doctor who it doesn't change anything and actually your episode is one of the highest rated episodes in your season so i don't know how it can really be underrated which is the question my episode is underrated because you don't really get a lot from capaldi up to that point like i said yes i said emotion in the sense of emotion anger is something we don't really see out of him so to get that from him in this episode was fantastic if you want to bring in ratings yours is the highest rated episode of season 10 so if you want to go toe to toe yours is not underrated by rating standards hell uh when it comes to time heist time heist is is a break from the monotonous sort of thing of the week because it's a situation we've never seen the doctor in that you think we could the entire story of time heist is so intricately intricately plotted that it's interesting to watch and see him get through all the puzzles yours actually doesn't actually show how far doctor who has come that's what day of the doctor is for when everyone comes back archive footage and re and bringing in the war doctor a totally different doctor we've never seen whereas your episode does a disservice to the legacy because it tries to introduce a new element to a doctor that we've had before and it does it falls completely flat because david bradley's not doing anything new with his performance of the first doctor he's just trying to do an impression of william hartnell and that's really hard to watch but that's like saying okay i begin again you're saying that like bringing this character back and bringing up like emotions that's literally everything now in media like you have avengers endgame all that does is bring stuff back that people love and that's why it brings out great emotion in it just because it's something old that you bring back doesn't do it a disservice it's just because maybe because you didn't want it doesn't mean that the general pop population and fans of doctor who didn't enjoy it it wasn't a highly it, it i don't i'm looking at imdb it's not my highly the highest rated episode in that season so i don't know where you got that you're but, looking at um, episode zero of a different season it ties into the last episode of the last season. i'm aware of what i'm looking at i'm okay. looking at okay. I, I think, I think, anyway no, thank you i did my anyway. part what I'm saying, what One I'm gonna say, left. what I'm gonna say for you is, is when you bring something back as fan service, that doesn't instantly make it good. That doesn't mean it's saying. good fan service. You said you're saying bringing it back like Endgame brings everything together means it's good. That does not make it good. Just because that's what people do today doesn't make it good. The thing about David Bradley is his performance doesn't work. It just doesn't. The entire plot of your episode, on top of it, doesn't Why even doesn't work. It work. Because Why does every it because you're trying to make a relationship between these two doctors that have no business with working with each other, their emotions don't play off each other, where the 12th Doctor is at that point in his life doesn't fit with the point of where any other character that you're bringing into this episode is, and the actual plot of going into this weird alien memory ball doesn't even work, it makes no sense, whereas mine is so tightly plotted that you can't even poke holes in the plot of Time Heist, it works so well. But you again, but again, it goes back to the fact that you opened your argument with that Capaldi's episodes are all like freak of the week type thing. Time Heist is just another one of those episodes. It's just another episode of Doctor Who that came and went, whereas least mine did something different and something Time. cool. All right. Uh, this is a good back and forth, guys. Much better than the than the last last uh, championship match first question. So props no. to both competitors. Um, no, we will go into uh, we'll go into the closing statements. Uh, we're gonna start off with Tim on this one. You got forty five cents to wrap up your argument to present them uh, to the judges accordingly. Yes, Twice Upon a Time is the last episode, Capaldi. It is the regeneration episode, as Caleb has said many times. And the fact that, uh, that he's not really giving me any proof as to why David Bradley isn't good in the episode. I think that the two of them, it shows how far the show has come. They go on a fun adventure. There's a lot of cool stuff in there. Uh, he's talking about the giant ball that they go, like, whatever. Like, a doc every Doctor Who episode has crazy, weird stuff in it like that. That's why people love Doctor Who. <laughs> Time Heist, unfortunately, though, is just another episode of Doctor Who. Yes, it's well written, and there's not there's no plot holes. That doesn't mean that. It, I'm not saying it's a bad episode. I'm just saying it's not the most underrated episode. Time Heist, unfortunately, is just another episode. Whereas Twice Upon a Time is something different that fans wanted to see. Right, Caleb, uh, your hundred seconds to wrap up the question. Twice upon a time, unfortunately, ends Cabaldi's on a down note because what it does is it tries to do what Day of the Doctor does, but worse. It tries to show, oh, look at what we've done with Doctor Who. But the thing is, that doesn't work. It doesn't work because David Bradley isn't doing anything as the first Doctor. He's just saying lines trying to sound like William Hartnell and Capaldi's not giving you the emotion Tim says he is like he doesn't help Ben or Heaven said the last season. Time Heist is actually a more important episode than that season because in that season, that episode means so much. It's the story of the Doctor and Clara, and it helps build their relationship, which gets paid off 
in the season finale of that season. And that's why Time Heist works so well, because it shows those two building off each other in the dynamic while going through a situation that we've never seen Capaldi be put in, and he does it flawlessly. Twice Upon a Time is the regeneration episode. They're always overrated. He gets to do all of his big, flashy get farewells, and it doesn't land as well as Time Heist does. In all, right. His- all right. Um... This is, uh, this is pretty good. This is uh, I think this set, set the pace for the match going forward. Uh, but I'm going to go over to the judges now for their decision, starting off with Cody. Um, who gets your point and why? Um, yeah, so uh, I, I, this is a rough one, and I don't mean to take a long time we're talking about this, but I don't feel like they argued the question. Um, I feel like they, I feel like one said that their episode's bad, and it's not like what's the best episode, what's the best underrated episode, and Coho told me that this episode's real freaking good, but didn't tell me why it's considered by people that are underrated, and neither did really Tim. Tim's the only one that brought actually underrated into the conversation. To say, you're saying it's underrated, but you're saying it's pretty dang good, So and it's highly rated. That made Tim bring back ratings, so all in all, I have to give Tim the vote, because that was the question. It wasn't what's the best episode, it's the best underrated episode. And Coho saying his was pretty much shit makes it underrated because there's good points to it. I don't right. know. It's a real weird, weird. Well, you're not the only judge here. I'm going to toss it over to Doug now. Uh, Doug, who gets your point and why? Uh, yeah, no. Um, same vein as Cody. Uh, there wasn't a lot of talking about why the episode was underrated in the community of uh, Hoobians. Um, and, you know, it's, it's a <laughs> – uh, yes, that's what they're called. It's timey wimey stuff. Uh, so, timey wimey right. Uh, so uh, yeah, uh, the only one that actually did mention anything that hinted to the question was Tim. So I got to give Tim the point on that one. Uh, so Tim does get that first point. I, I would I would agree with both with both Cody and Doug. I think there was a lot that was sort of left on the table. Um, the way that the, for the way the freeform started, it seemed like Caleb was sort of going into the route that he normally does, but then he sort of caught uh, caught into his own into his own game. Um, he definitely gave a little, little more a little more facts, but Tim definitely catered to the question better. Um, so Tim does get that first point. Uh, but I forgot are, to uh, argue uh, an entire point that was written down on my board, and I realized it too late, and I was like, "Fuck." <laughs> <laughs> Which is that it comes after the highest rated episode of Doctor Who in history. Oh, fuck me. Okay, good job, Tim. All right. Well, uh, Tim does get the first point, uh, but we, it is a race to four, so there is still plenty of game to be played. Uh, we're going to go right into question number two. Probably the question that I'm most excited for uh, is the Harry Potter question. Uh, and it is, what is the most satisfying moment uh, in Harry Potter? Um, we're going to be starting off with Tim on this one. You have one minute. Uh, the floor is yours. When you look at Harry Potter, when you look at the story from Sorcerer's Stone to Deathly Hallows, from beginning to end, um, there's a lot of really great moments. Um, There's a lot of fun moments, but when it comes to satisfying, um, the only, I think, option is the epilogue of Deathly Hallows Part 2, the the epilogue. Um, And there's many reasons why, and a lot of, like, filmmaking stuff has to come into that, too, like the score of the scene and whatnot. I'll get into a lot of that, but what it basically comes down to is the fact that you spend so much time with these characters. You spend so much time with Harry, Ron, and Hermione. And to just know they make it, and everything is good, they defeated evil, they have kids they get to send them off to hogwarts um the performances in this scene make it fantastic the score makes it fantastic it's so satisfying just to see all of this wrapped up in this beautiful beautiful way that's why it's the most all right right. over to caleb now for your answer uh do you feel what is the most satisfying moment in harry potter okay when you watch doctor who or not doctor who fuck when you watch harry potter uh, there are char- there's one specific character that you see as the villain all the way through once she gets introduced that you're like, man, I want this person to fucking die. And that's Bellatrix Lestrange. She literally kills all of these people who are so important to Harry, kills Sirius Black, and literally just you see her take so much and be so wicked and creepy and evil to Harry and all of his friends that you're like, I'm just waiting for her to go. The person who gets to take her out makes this even better when you get Mrs. Weasley with don't touch my daughter, you bitch, and just kills her. 
is the best way. Because you see, every time Bellatrix shows up, she kills whoever she's going for. She's deadly. She's lethal. She's terrifying. And the fact that you get the maternal instincts of, of Molly Weasley's mom just coming in and protecting her and being the one to take her out is so satisfying. Especially with the line, not my daughter, you bitch. It's perfect. Time. All right. Over into the free form. Five minutes. You guys know the drill. Let's get it on. I will start right away since you jumped in last time. Uh, the, the quote is get away from her, your bitch. If you're going to quote it, at least quote it correctly. Um, you, as you well. quote it correctly. Uh, no, I just said it. Get you did your bitch. Her. Anyway. No, I didn't. But anyway, uh, Bellatrix appears in The Order of the Phoenix. You act like she appeared in Sorcerer's Stone and has been this like looming presence for the long time. She killed Sirius Black. The person who that offends the most is Harry. If it would have been satisfying, the question is satisfying for anybody to kill Bellatrix. It actually would have been Harry or even Lupin, Sirius's friend. But no, Molly Weasley comes in. It's a cool line. I'll give you that because oh, she said bitch in Harry Potter. Oh my God, that's so cool. But no, whereas uh, the epilogue actually brings out emotion, actually brings out um, really cool character moments, really cool pieces throughout the entire sequence. Yours is just like, oh, this character is now going to die. She's evil. Yes, she dies. Mr. Robert Parker, if you could please stop using buzzwords about pieces and emotion, your epilogue leaves more questions than answers, especially setting up an adventure with the kids that I'd much rather watch than knowing that Harry's okay. Harry and them are okay at the end of the movie when they throw the freaking Elder Wand off the bridge. We know they won. We know they won. We know what happens next. They won. It's over. The epilogue is just overkill. It's sending off his kids to Hogwarts and then going, oh, well, what if I'm a Slytherin? What if this... I want to see the movie where he becomes a Slytherin. I want to see the sequel. I want to see eight, nine, whatever movie they're on now about his kids. You set up a future that we're never going to get now. Whereas Why? nine is closing off the loop of this character though. Yes, she came in at five, but we've hated her since five. She barely, okay, well, first of all, she barely appears in the movies. She's in two scenes in five. She's in like two scenes she in six. She steals every scene she's in in them though. That's utterly false. But the other point is, why does everything have to set up something else? Why does why can't we just have this nice wrap up with uh, Harry, Ron, and Hermione and the kids? You get to see, um, you get to even see Draco Malfoy with a wife that sends off a kid to Hogwarts as well. Um, and it's the emotional. Mo I'm sorry, uh, emotional. It's true. It's very emotional for Harry's son to go. I don't. I, I'm nervous. I don't want to. I don't want to get into Slytherin. And Harry imparting that knowledge. It's a nice wink at the audience and at the characters. But again, you're talking about a side character, Molly Weasley, who comes in for three seconds to go get away from her, you bitch. And then just like, yeah, it's a cheering moment, but satisfying overall. It's satisfying to see these characters move on. It doesn't have to set up another sequel. Not ask everything J has to set up something else. Ask J.K. Rowling when you ask that question, why is she setting something up at the end of the movie? She is. That's what that is. That's a setup for the next thing. It's literally it's showing you it's showing you the future of where Harry Potter could go. And I'd rather watch the future after that. I want to see where we go next that's what that uh, thing sets up it's not you want it to be the end it's not the end there's more to come and we want to see that whereas the satisfying ending for bellatrix lestrange is to see her finally die and the person who does it is the person that we've seen be restrained be caring be loving through all the through and for her to break and be like get away from her you bitch don't not my daughter you bitch the entire fucking aura of what she does and kills her is so perfect because it's finally seeing a character that we've seen relaxed and restrained come unrestrained to protect the people she cares about and loves and kill the most infuriating deadly character in the series you can underplay oh she just killed Sirius Black or whatever that's a big fucking thing no I'm not underplaying the fact that she killed Sirius I'm underplaying the fact that if you're saying that like if it's satisfying for Bellatrix to die it would have been more satisfying for Harry to be the one to do it or Lupin to do it not Molly Molly and Bellatrix have no connection other than the fact that Bellatrix had a spell at Ginny but the other thing that Which you just said Molly Weasley restrained are you on fucking crack in Chamber of Secrets, she sends a fucking howler to Ron and screams at him. Right, in front that's of the Bull setup. Bull. That's the setup in, for this moment. In Half Blood Prince, when the fucking when, burrow, the when the burrow gets attacked, she's one of the first ones out there with her wand attacking. Which shows death. her bravery and shows and that she could. It shows that she could it, pull, pull it, off let that. Let me moment. finish. It contradicts your exact point that you made of her being a restrained character and this being the first time that she cracks. This is not the first time that Molly Weasley has done something like this. But I'm gonna go back to my thing again is the fact 
that you're talking about this scene, my epilogue scene, needing to set up this grander thing. It's just a bow on an already perfect gift. It's just the final piece that makes it perfect. It's not, it's not the perfect bow because whether you think it should or not, it does set up what comes next. It's showing new problems, new conflicts within new characters what that we are going problem? to follow in the future that we should see. That is not a satisfying conclusion. We're never going to get those movies. You're yes, saying that it's, that it's setting something up. You're never, I promise you, you are never going to see the cursed child, the movie. They're Time. Movie. They're not. Time. Do not make me use my mother, my motherly voice. Um, we'll now go into uh, going in, going to the closing statements. Uh, we're going to start off with Caleb. Uh, once again, forty-five seconds uh, to wrap up your argument. Harry Potter's off fighting Voldemort. Bellatrix runs around. She's killing people that we care about. It's the Battle of Hogwarts, and she is going to kill. Ginny Weasley, the person there to protect her is her mother. And to see Molly have those motherly instincts and to be the one to take out Bellatrix is so satisfying because she actually gets killed. To see Bellatrix die is satisfying. And that moment is so fun and so perfect in Molly being the one to do it that you're underplaying, oh, it should be Harry. Harry's off fighting the big bad Voldemort. That's the satisfying conclusion for Harry to be doing. Bellatrix dying by Molly? perfect bow as you would like to say whereas your epilogue whether you think it does or not actually sets up new conflicts new characters and new ways avenues of storytelling and that's what we are going to explore they're literally making it they're cutting off fantastic beasts at three to Time. make her child true all right over to uh tim to wrap up the question I'm glad Caleb is using fake information to bring into his argument. Um, that's not true. They're making five Fantastic Beasts movies, but I won't let that distract me. I also said Lupin. He's acting like I only talked about Harry. I also said Lupin. Sirius Black's best friend is Lupin, and Lupin saw him die too. Lupin was at the Battle of Hogwarts. He could have also been the one to kill Bellatrix, and it would have been more satisfying because he's avenging his friend. He's avenging his best friend. Molly Weasley being there and being the one to kill Bellatrix is cool. Satisfying? It doesn't make any sense in the course of the story, whereas my scene, okay, whether it does set up something else or not, that's still satisfying. It's satisfying to see these new characters go off to know that they're going to have a potential adventure. It's fantastic. The, scene, the, the acting is great in the scene. The music's great. It's a perfect scene. Okay, um, I I was very satisfied with with with, with, the, with this question. I think that I think it was good. There was a great back and forth for the most part. Uh, but we'll go to the judges now for their decision. Uh, Cody, uh, we'll go to you. Uh, who gets your point and why? I always hate you leading off of me, but it's the only way it can be. Um, <coughs> uh, Co Co fought really hard. He tried his damnedest. Um. Throwing out a lot of info. Um, don't know a lot of it's factual, and I don't know how much came out of his ass, but I give him uh, two points for trying. Uh, but my point goes to Tim. Uh, Tim pointed out facts why it would make his scene more satisfying. He kind of shut down that there's, instead of why can't it just end, why can't it just be a positive note? Um, I, I like the counteract that the other one got thrown. We know that the Indian, blah, blah, blah. But I, th I think it was really hard to combat like that being a satisfying moment. But, again, two other judges, so tell me if I'm wrong. Um, I'm going to go next, uh, and I actually agree with Cody. Uh, I th for me, I think Tim sort of had that had, had that almost like a head start going in the minute that he was like, this is not actually what she, what she said, and really sort of kept – kept the pace going from there um ultimately what this came down to for me is is how is how the defenses were sold um because i think both had great offenses but ultimately um i think tim tim's attack of like um uh the mother mother of the weasels uh she like you sort of like you sort of see this from cha from chamber of secrets and that there are other people that, that could be doing it kale just didn't give me enough as as to why she had to be that person um, so Tim does get my point. Doug, your vote did not count, but but how would you have swayed? Uh, yeah, I agree with Cody and Brooklyn uh, on the fight. It was uh, it it came down to how you guys fought defensively uh, and countered each argument for me as well. Um, and it, it just seemed like uh, every answer that Co uh, that Caleb gave, kind of Tim had a counterbalance for it. So like it was like more uh, heavy handed towards Tim. Uh, so Tim would have got my point. All right. Uh, so Tim does go up to nothing. Uh, as 
we they they did talk about that on Collider, Fantastic Beasts three being reworked to wrap up, so then they could make Curse of Child. That wasn't bullshit. So, that was actually so a thing they talked about on Collider. That's nice. They they, talked about they on did they did on the no I'm just I, no I it's just, fair. I was just I saying. just checked it out. Uh, they talked about it because of JK's tweet, and then it, another article came out that it was false. Okay. Fact checker Doug coming in Sorry, with a hashtag. I tried. Facts. I tried. All right. Well, as my great grandfather used to say, wish in one hand, shit in the other. Um, we will go I'm into shit in your hand, Grandpa. <laughs> it's so much sanitary. <laughs> Question number three uh, is going to come in the category of animated heroes, and uh, and the person that picked this category specified it to Avengers: Earth's Mightiest Heroes. So we decided to go with uh, with a pretty standard, straightforward question: uh, Who is the best villain in Avengers: Earth's Mightiest Heroes? Uh, we're going to start off with Caleb. Uh, you have one minute. Um, the floor is yours. When it comes to the villains in Avengers: Earth's Mightiest Heroes, you have an entire rogues gallery to pick from, but I think the person who had the most impact on the Avengers, that had the most impact on the viewers, is Kang the Conqueror. Uh, as soon as he comes in, to give you a backstory, Kang the Conqueror is a ruler of Earth in the 41st century, and what happens is a anomaly from the past causes his future to be completely wiped out, and he looks and he believes it to be Captain America surviving World War II, so he comes back from the past and tries to convince Captain America to go back to the past and to die, but it turns out that it's not completely confirmed that that's why it happens and that the Kree Skrull War was not a result of Captain America and all this stuff. So they get into a fight to the point where they have to bring in Tim's character, who also loses to Kang the Conqueror uh, in that episode. Uh, and Kang the Conqueror actually succeeds in annihilating the Earth, and the Avengers have to come back and win. And that's a two-parter that they pull off, and Kang the Conqueror is the most uh, emotionally rich villain and the most devastating villain. He's one of the only villains to actually succeed in winning to the point where the Avengers have to imprison him in a time machine to win. All right. Over to Tim now for your answer. Uh, um, what is the best, or who is the best villain uh, in Avengers Earth's Mightiest Heroes? Yeah, Caleb kind of alluded to it. If you don't know the plot of the show, um, it's basically there's a giant breakout, lots of villains around. It's like uh, villain of the week. Avengers going around catching villains. Um, so the only, one of the few villains in this show that actually like isn't one of those, though, that has a long arc throughout both seasons of the show is Ultron. And um, I think Ultron is the most interesting, the best villain in the show because of his emotional connection to the Avengers, um, his connection to Hank, his connection to Tony, um, the fact that they created him and the fact that he, um, yes, as Caleb alluded to, uh, actually helps them with defeating Kang. Um, he says that Kang defeated the, uh, Ultron. Well, actually, it's kind of the other way around, but we'll get to that, I'm sure. So, uh, yeah, Ultron is a very interesting villain. They did some interesting stuff with him in this show, and I will be glad to talk about more of it uh, once uh, these two seconds are up. Excellent. Uh, we'll go right into the five minutes of free form. I don't need to say anything. You guys know the drill. You guys are pretty good for, for filibustering, uh, but uh, let's get it on. The whole reason why Ultron becomes evil is because Kang beats him. That's why he becomes evil. That's why they have to reprogram him. They reprogram him to be a fighter, mm -hmm. and Kang beats him, and then he gets jaded. He gets evil. He gets cynical. And that's why And he doesn't have a connection to the Avengers. He has a connection to Hank Pym. And Hank Pym breaks off from the Avengers because Tony Stark tried to sell the Ultron deck. So Ultron's arc is, I'm going to build a Jocasta body and build a wife for myself. And then they killed the wife and deprogram Ultron. And then in season two, he comes back and gets beaten in one episode. Ultron is a villain of the week by we get to season two his arc of season one is very slow and boring no it's not slow and boring at all the fact that ultron comes in um he's there throughout many episodes just because he's not big bad ultron at this point he's still there learning and yes they reprogram him but the fact that he has this almost human consciousness inside of him he has hank's human brain waves inside of him makes him a more compelling character than kang kang is just another alien on a ship with an army he barely does any of the fighting he sends other people to go and fight for him big armies which we've seen a thousand times in other shows he's just another purple bad guy sitting in a chair whereas ultron is actually something different within the uh, uh, in the show up to that point. ultron is nothing different he's literally a robot when you say he has emotion he doesn't have that emotion kang has that emotion kang is motivated by saving his wife he's the mr freeze of this series he's motivated to save his wife who 
who is kept in stasis in the future. And if he can say, convince Captain America to go back in time and die, which he thinks will fix the timeline, then his wife will live and he'll get his life back. And that's what he's fighting for. He has something that he's actually fighting for that makes him emotional and connectable and relatable. Ultron is just a robot who has Hank Pym's brain and doesn't fucking use it because he sits there for three episodes doing nothing, gets beaten after making a robot wife. And then after he gets beaten, disappears for a season, comes back one episode and gets beaten again by the Avengers. There's no arc to Ultron. He doesn't learn anything. There's just more action with Ultron, but Kang is the one who actually grows. That's okay. So saying that it's just action with Ultron is bullshit because the fact you're talking about that he doesn't have any human emotion and that he's just a robot. Like I know I already said it, but Hank's brainwaves are in there. And just because the emotion isn't coming from Ultron himself, it's, it's going out across the Avengers when they think that Thor died, when he disintegrates Hulk and, or I'm sorry, when he disintegrates Thor and everybody thinks Thor is dead, that brings the Avengers together to go. That is much more of an Avengers level villain. Whereas Kang, I know you're saying this big stuff, big stuff with him, you know, destroying the world, blah, blah, blah. He's more of a Captain America villain. He comes back for Captain America and the Avengers are just kind of there helping him along the way. Whereas at least Ultron, it's a all Avengers. Everybody has, has an emotional connection somehow to Ultron, whereas the, the connection with Kang is more just so Captain America. And the Ultron is a Hank Pym villain, but the Avengers are just there because Hank Pym is the creation. No. That's the same thing. The thing no. is, he comes back. He comes back in I time. To, he comes back in time. Why? Hey, I let you talk. I let you talk. I, he came back in time to get Captain America. Yeah, that's the point. But the Avengers rally around together to save Captain America. That's the bringing around point. And he doesn't even kill Thor. You're like, oh, that brings the Avengers together. Yeah, Kang does the same thing when he comes back in time to get Captain America. Thor's alive. Thor does not die. Ultron I'm doesn't aware. kill a single soul in there. And the Kang actually destroys the Earth. The Avengers have to rebuild the Earth after Kang fights him. Ultron does disintegrate Thor. It's just they think he's dead. Just because he's not actually dead doesn't mean that the Avengers don't think that he's dead. And they do rally around it. Let me finish. You, you just got on me for that. So then they actually do think that he's dead. So it, that does cause a reason to rally. And so, the, but again, when you're talking about your episodes of them rallying around Captain America, they're rallying around an army of random aliens, faceless aliens, faceless goons, where at least with Ultron, yes, there are faceless robots there. No but minute. if Ultron is there the entire time, calm, collected, and also just evil as all hell. Kang just sits in a chair and yells at people to do Kang things. has a physical battle with Captain America, a mano e mano battle. So if you want to say Kang sits in a chair doesn't do anything, he fights Avengers more than Ultron does. Ultron that sends is. the faceless robot goons and they get busted and then he goes oh i'm gonna zap a person they don't die kang literally gets off his ass beats captain america destroys the earth and they have to use time travel to fix it he literally wins. so they still win though they in still... the end but kang succeeded in doing something ultron you can't even say ultron succeeded in doing a single thing he succeeded, he succeeded in succeeded making the big thor died he's oh he did succeed in killing thor and making them making think thor, thor die that's 100 that's 100 percent thing he attacks shields helicarrier and attacks maria hill and gets control of all of their nukes and sends all of the nukes to destroy the world and the avengers guess what they stop them just like they stop Kang. time time this might be the closest thing i can witness to watching like essentially cody and i debating can you let me talk can you let me talk that was uh it's odd but um let's go into the closing statements here uh starting off with tim um, you're gonna have four and a half seconds to wrap up your arguments and present them to uh, to Beavis, Spothead, and uh, and Doug. So. Ultron is a presence throughout the entire series of Earth's Mightiest Heroes. From the beginning to the end, Kang is a one, two, three episode in and out, in and defeated. Yes, he technically defeats the Avengers, but guess what? The Avengers come back and beat him. So in the end, it doesn't really matter. Ultron creates a lot of interesting things throughout the season for the team. It creates drama with Hank and the team. Um, it creates uh, a lot of stuff between, like I said, the Avengers rallying together to attack Ultron when they think that Thor is gone. It, it's, the fi it's the first time you actually get a real sense of this is a team of heroes coming together. Kang is just another alien ripoff who sits there and yells at people to go and do things for him all the time. All right. Over to Caleb now to wrap up uh, the question. 
like I said in the opening, in the main freeform, Kang gets off his ass and actually almost kills Captain America, destroys the Earth, he beats the Avengers, and they have to use an entire second episode to fix it. They can't do that with Ultron. Ultron doesn't win in any of his episodes. He's never succeeded in anything. Even the big, oh, I took over the shield hail carrier. They destroyed him in the same episode. The thing is, Kang actually comes back in the second season and has an impact, whereas Ultron's in one episode and gets destroyed again. Kang actually comes back and almost succeeds again, so they have to put him in the time travel machine and lock him up for good, like I said, in the main round. So Kang is done more to hurt the Avengers. The Avengers have rallied behind uh, behind uh, Captain America in that episode because Kang comes the closest to beating them through beating Captain America and Captain America is shaken for the rest of the series because of it. He is literally shaken and you had to fight literally the fake Avenger Scrolls in season two. Time. All right. All right. Um, over to the judges now for their decision. I'm going to start with Cody. So it's taken me a year and a half, but I finally know why everybody hates fighting Coho. Coho treats you like you're a fucking idiot. He literally, like, um, let me tell you, I'm going to tell you why you're an idiot, and let me explain to me. I will explain a great deal why you're an idiot. Uh, let me break it down for you. Uh, but I have to go with uh, Coho on this one. Um, <clears throat> I wish I could tell um, teenage self that there will be a day that people argue about animated shows on the internet, and you will not feel so alone anymore at the lunch table. It happened today. I was fucking lost. But Coho knew so much about it, and it just seemed like Ultron was just at a disadvantage at this point. Um, so at that point, I had to give Coho. He knew so much, and threw so much information, and pretty much combated everything that was thrown out. But it was close. But I, I, you know, I give it to Caleb. All right. uh, over to Doug now for your decision. Uh, yeah. Um, this was really intense to watch. The uh, the breakdown of hey, can I speak? I let you speak. Um, was great because uh, kind of like changed the shift of the kind the kind of tone of the debate when that when that line was thrown out because it kind of like made somebody stumble a little bit and was like, but, but uh, no, I I I think overall what Co pitched was a more menacing villain. Um, I can understand Tim's uh, points, uh, but someone that kind of shook Captain America for the rest of the seasons. Not say I'm taking that as the only argument point, but I'm just saying in general, just to like sum it up. Um, but yeah, Coho got my point that round. All right. So Coho does get the points. Uh, this is this this is a cold day in hell. I I've agreed with Cody on I think I think every question. Uh, Coho Coho had it. I think he uh, I think he learned his lesson uh, from the last time and really sold me on on his defense. And I think those facts that we know that he has in in his strengths really really um, presented themselves. Um, efficiently in this one, so he does get the point. Uh, so it is two to one as we go into question number four, uh, which is going to be in uh, in Lord of the Rings. Uh, you know, I'm you know I, I know a lot to Lord of the Rings, so I'm going to have tons of bias going into this. Not at all. Um, and the question was, uh, what is the best line in Lord of the Rings: Return of the King? Um, and we're going to be starting off with Tim on this one. You have one minute. Uh, to give us your answer and uh, and open up the question. The entire trilogy of Lord of the Rings um, is about friendship and fellowship, if you will. Um, it is that's what it's about. That's literally from beginning to end. It's about friendship, fellowship between these characters, and not a single relationship is stronger and tested and. Uh, used in the series more than Frodo and Sam. And Sam has been along Frodo's side the entire time, wanting to help, being a loyal companion, even when Frodo's at his worst. So when they're finally at Mount Doom and Frodo just can't do it anymore, he's been beaten, he's been stabbed by a fucking giant spider, he's been attacked by orcs at Kirith Ungle, and he just can't do it anymore. So what does Sam do? What does he say? I can't carry it for you, but I can carry you. He lifts up his friend and carries him the final steps. It's incredible. It's the best line. All right. Over now to Caleb for your answer for the question. Uh, once again, what is the best line in Lord of the Rings Return of the King? 
Yeah, no. Uh, so when it comes to the Return of the King, you have all these incredible battles uh, and sequences where there's people fighting, and the visual storytelling is super strong, especially in the scene where the Witch King comes down and his. Uh, I don't know if it's a dragon or what the fuck, but that beast literally eats the fuck out of a king, throws him, and this uh, girl named a I Eowyn stands up with a sword, oh my God. And, and she stands there, and the witch king is the most menacing fucker, and she still decapitates the dragon, the witch king is kicking her ass, and she still stands there, though she's terrified, and finally, the witch king says, I, no man can kill me, and she takes off the helmet, and stabs him through the face when she gets the chance and says, I am no man. That line is fucking sweet. That is the moment that makes you stand up and cheer more so than the abusive Sam Frodo line relationship. Uh, and it is the moment that makes you in that movie stand and cheer the most. And it is the most impactful, powerful line that is said in the entire film. Fight me, Tim. Let's go. All right. Well, uh, we're just going to copy and paste what I said in questions one and two and three and paste them into here. So five minutes. Let's get it on. Caleb. Okay. First of all, you don't know the name of the character. Anyway. You're talking, but you don't know how to pronounce it correctly. Uh, yeah, you got there. You stumbled a little bit, but anyway. um, no, I, the scene you're talking about, it's a great scene. Don't get me wrong. Um, it is a fun scene, yes, to see the Witch King come down and have Eowyn stab him in the face and say, I am no man. It's very cool. Uh, but when you're looking at the film as a whole and what has happened throughout the movie, there's nothing better than uh, Sam picking up Frodo, carrying him, saying, I can't carry it for you, but I can carry you. It's symbolic of the entire film as a whole. Yours is just a cool action scene, lots of battle stuff, cool. This is the whole story. It's the whole thing. If and the whole about, story is this scene, it is problematic thing. as fuck because Sam is the most abused character because Frodo's a bitch. Frodo is laying at the bottom of Mount Doom. They haven't fucking climbed this damn mountain yet. Yes, There's so much more to go, and he fucking lays down like a bitch and has Sam go, I'll carry you, Master Frodo, I'll carry you, all the way up the fucking mountain. It's so stupid. Also, technically, the ADR for that scene is terrible. Their lips do not match up to the line Lines being stated, which makes what it even harder to watch. That's such a hard, I watched both scenes for this. It's such a hard moment to watch, and that line cannot be taken seriously because it's not coming out of his mouth at the right time. Okay, well, A, that's just not true. I, I, you, no, it's not. You must have been watching a bad YouTube rip from 2006. But um, the, the point, again, like you're talking about the fact that you clearly don't know anything about the story because the fact that Frodo just lays there. It's not like he's laying down to take a nap. He had just been stabbed three times and then gets carried up the mountain by Sam. You're talking about Sam being an abused character. No, it's not about Sam being an abused character. It's about Sam being the strong character. It's finally showing that throughout everything that's happened to Sam, he's come back and been the hero. Frodo, you're right, is a little bitch. But Sam is there to say, no, you know what, Frodo? I can't carry it for you. I can carry you. Again, your scene, all you talked about was, eh, it looks cool, this dragon type thing. I don't really know what it's fucking called. Lands down, and then, uh, yeah, she rips off her helmet and stabs the guy. How many times have we seen sure, that? Sure, under... Undercut the importance of maybe one of the most important action sequences of the century because that's literally oh, something we've never seen. Up to that, that point, of the say that, century. say this, say this to me, Tim. When was the last time before this that you saw a woman stab a fucking beast that was terrifying in the face? That well, was actually, awesome. In the, in the two towers, when Eowyn did it, also in the two towers to a different type beast. Wonderful, but, but the Witch King has more importance. Whereas <laughs> Sam literally is been is carrying Frodo the entire trilogy. Sam and has again, been of, Sam has literally been the hero the entire trilogy and you're saying oh frodo's a bitch but he he's the hero no frodo literally does that. nothing sam should be the one that's throwing the ring in mount doom so when he does that he's laying down like a bitch and getting whipped well you just cut out so i'm gonna take this opportunity to talk because you froze on my screen i don't know if that is okay he's frozen for me can you guys hear me he's also he's also frozen on my end so we should probably pause Yeah. See me. I don't know if you can see me. North Dakota snow is piling up on my internet, but I'll I'll just say what I said. Uh, that Frodo 
does nothing this entire trilogy, and Sam's the one who's been carrying him the entire time. So to see him literally have to carry him now is just sad, because Sam then is should be the one that throws the ring. This movie should be entirely about Sam, and Sam literally is being relegated to being Frodo's slave, for lack of a better term, trying to carry him up the damn mountain, when Frodo literally hasn't done anything at all to be exhausted this entire trilogy. Sam's been doing everything. He he hasn't done anything to be exhausted, dude. He he's been stabbed multiple times. He was cocooned by a spider. But again, we're getting off the point of the subject that we're talking about—the line and the line. What my line represents of I can can't carry it for you, but I can carry you. It's showing that Sam is the strong character and can carry him. You can call Frodo the bitch all you want. That Sam, you, you're just taking what I'm saying and trying to make it look like you know what you're talking about. But in the end, your scene is just a cool scene with a cool line in it, but it doesn't amount to anything in the end of the story. This line, this moment, this singular moment in the story encapsulates everything that we've been leading up to. And if you that's can the story, that, then that's a bad story. If that's the line that encapsulates the story, that's why you that's haven't a seen bad, the movie. It's a bad line because it's encapsulating a bad story then, because guess what? That line is stupid. It's cringy. It's him going, oh, you know what? You, you can't do anything. You're the worst character we've ever seen, so now I'm going to just put the team on my back and do what I've been doing the entire trilogy, which is stupid. That's lame. Also, I said what I said before you. But the thing about and Aowen scene and her line and why it's so important is because of the way it's delivered, the way that she gives it. It actually has more importance outside of the even the film. It's an important line for people to even think about. Have you like Aowen doing this killing the Witch King? and saying that I'm not a man is the perfect retort and shows a strong sort of empowerment of that line that I think is more important than, oh, I'm going to put the team on you, my back and you carry you like I can this not, entire trilogy. But again, you're not even talking about the fact that Aowen is doing this because her dad just died and everything. You, you're you just looking at the one line. Time. Which is the okay. Um, let's go into the, uh, let's go into the, to the closing arguments here. We're going to start off with Caleb, 45 seconds to wrap up your arguments. Tim keeps saying, oh, it's all about the story. It's all about this, all about that. If the line is supposed to symbolize the story, then the story is dog shit because the line is dog shit. The delivery is dog shit. The ADR to make that line sync up to the mouth is dog shit. The entire thing about that moment falls flat because he's saying, oh, it has all this emotional intensity. It has none of it because the scene is done so poorly. Sam, Sean Astin is terrible in that scene and Frodo's laying there doing absolutely nothing because he's exhausted. He hasn't had any reason to stab three times. Sure, whatever the fuck. I don't really give a fuck whatever your plotting is for this because it doesn't make sense at that point. We don't care about those two at that point because it's all about Sam. It's always been about Sam and Sam doesn't get to do anything except just deliver this cringy half-ass line. Whereas Eowyn gives maybe the coolest line, the most important line of the entire film, which is I stand for no man when she saves her father and she kills the most scary villain in the entire series. Time. All right. Over to Tim now to wrap up the question. A scary villain in the entire series that we've seen three times in the entire series. Yeah, really. Um, no, Caleb, again, you're talking about one, like this one line as if it's the greatest thing to ever happen. But literally the fact that th the story is take the ring, drop it in Morador. The fact that Sam is the one who gets Frodo there, says this line, carries him up there. That's the whole story. It's the entire story. That's why it's the best line. You kept talking about how your line is a cool line, but literally, no, this is, you do care about this. Everyone in the story cares about this because at the same time as this, this, Aragorn and everybody's attacking the Black Gate for Frodo. And Sam, they literally say that. So this is the most important. This is the best line. I can't carry it for you, but Time. I can carry you. Okay. That was a really interesting question. Might be the first time I've heard mockery uh, on both sides of, of the floor. So uh, I, I guess an, an applause to both for uh, for adding something new to a debate. But um, let's go on to the judges. Uh, start off with Cody. Who gets your point and why? Um. <laughs> One just major fact correction. Sam can't drop the ring. That's the whole point of the story. Just saying that one right now. Sam's not, Sam can't drop the ring. So I know that he's, that was one of his major points. Um, I'm giving it to Tim because Tim just battered him. I, I think he got – I think Tim almost screwed himself a little bit because he almost did the Caleb times two. He's like, okay, you idiot. You don't know much about anything, but – he patched. He put it with facts. Every time Caleb would like counter something, he had a rebuttal, and then he said, "We when's the last time you saw a female do this?" 
blah, blah, blah. And he's like, in the two towers, the movie prior that you have not seen, pretty much. So it was rough. Uh, Tim gets my point. But again, we have two other judges, so I might be right. I'm gonna sound like a broken record, but once again, I I, I I agree with I agree with Cody. This is essentially the the best, like the 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 most divisive in, ter- in terms in terms of forms. Uh, I said said this before on the show: offense wins games, but defense wins championships. And this is essentially Caleb like trying to throw as many haymakers as he can, and Tim being like, "Nah, fuck you, nah, fuck you, nah, fuck you." Like, here's why all your points don't really don't really add up. Um, I applaud Caleb for the for for the effort, but um, Tim Tim's defense just just sold this for me right from right from the first minutes. Um, maybe his defense even even cut out Caleb's internet, but we'll uh, we'll never know. Um, so he gets the he gets the the the, the last prep question point. Doug, um, who would have gotten your points? Uh, yeah, I'm gonna say uh, Tim. Uh, countering probably did mess up uh <laughs> mess up the internet connection. Um. <laughs> no, but I, it literally was uh, the same thing that Cody and Brooklyn said. I, this is insane. We've been on the same mark the entire match. Uh, maybe we all share a hive mind at one point. Um, anyway, no. Uh, great match to both you guys. But yeah, Tim gets the two broke. towers. Uh, defense broke my internet, I'm going to say right now, because <laughs> I knew at that moment I was fucking dead in the water. His internet is like, fuck, we got to do here. We got we to restart. We got to try. We gotta no, the, the internet straight up just like cut it. He's like, no, you're dead. That was it. <laughs> Call the white flag. Throw the white towel. We All right, so... All right, so as we move into uh, the speed round question, uh, Tim uh, does have a score of three to one, so he only needs to win one of these speed round questions to advance. Uh, so for these speed round questions, uh, the competitors did not get to pick any categories. Myself and Cody um, assessed both both competitors and felt what were the most balanced categories. Uh, this one is actually pretty easy uh, compared compared to the last one, I, I think. Um, but uh, we'll go into the first speed round question. Uh, so it works as always. Um, I will say the question in its entirety. When it, if you answer first, you will be going first. Uh, it will be a 40-second opening followed by a 30-second 30 uh, 30-second rebuttal. Um, are you going to say it twice? Are you going to say it twice like we did last, like with Caleb and Jay, or are you going to just say it once? It was just once. I don't. I wasn't just there that. for La- yeah. last time for Caleb and J- for the last match for Caleb yeah. and Jay's match. We said it twice. So I just. I, I don't care either way. Yeah. I just want to okay. know. Just to for any connection issue, just say it twice. Just say for, it twice. Just okay. like, especially with Caleb already cutting out once. I don't want anybody to. So I'm so <laughs> I'm going to so how it's going to go is I'm going to say here is your first question again and uh, again listen carefully. I will say the question and then I will say again the question and then that's when you guys will give your answers. Okay. Yep. All right. Best of luck, guys. Once again, three to one, Tim. Uh, you only need one point, uh, Caleb. Uh, you do need to win. Uh, you need to win all three of these. So, all right, your first speed round question is as follows. Who is the most underrated Pixar character? Again, who is the most underrated Pixar character? Hector. Hector. I heard first. I will go with I will go I I will go with Rex. Rex. All right. So we have Kale giving Hector from Coco and then we have Tim giving Rex from uh from Toy Story. Wasn't sure. Wasn't sure if there was uh, an obscure good dinosaur character that I was that I was missing. Oh, I hope not. Jeez. You gotta fucking love Arlo, though, right? <laughs> Let's fucking go, Arlo. Most yeah. underrated. I got a T-shirt that says Arlo's the goat. Uh, but... <laughs> All right, guys. So I did hear uh, Kale first with Hector. Uh, so you're gonna have 40 seconds for your opening statement. Um, super strict with time here. So time is gonna begin the second we start talking. Uh, 
Hector is the most important and underrated character from Coco because when you think about Coco and Pixar in general, the main characters are usually the ones that you think about or the more like the like animal sidekicks or whatever. But I think Hector's arc going from the sort of trickster that's trying to be remembered until you realize that he's got a much deeper, more emotional story as being murdered by Ernesto de la Cruz as being this person that only just wants to connect with his family, want, that wants to be close and remembered and his legacy that is told throughout the entire story of Coco, I think is more beautiful and resonant whereas Rex is just sort of this funny side character that gives quips throughout four Toy Story movies and he's not really even in the fourth one he's just kind of in the rv and has maybe one line from wallace sean it's really a mediocre performance from wallace sean and a mediocre character hector is maybe the best character in coco all right over to tim now for the opening statement thank you for telling me that caleb that hector is the best character in coho uh, in coco i agree uh therefore he's not underrated if he's the best character the co-lead of the movie he's there as the co-lead and the best character you just said it uh therefore he's not really underrated rex like you said is in the background and always delivers the funniest and the best lines like how do you spell fbi like that's just hilarious and it brings this nice levity to other scenes in the toy story franchise but like you said hector is the best Part of Coco. Uh, therefore, he's not an underrated character because I think he's widely agreed to be one of the best, uh, I'll say it again, emotional parts of the movie. His story is great. Rex is also Time. hilarious. All right. Over to Caleb now for your 30 second rebuttal. The most popular character and the most overrated of the Cocos are Miguel and Dante. Those are the two you see on all the merchandise. You never see a Hector t-shirt anywhere. Uh, you see Rex on t-shirts. Rex got his own fucking Pixar shorts. So if you're going to say oh, but underrated, the man is literally the star of his own material in terms of Pixar and does not deliver funny lines. In fact, his lines usually bring down the movies because it re reminds you these are kids' movies, whereas Hector's entire arc in the film is what makes Coco a more adult-oriented Pixar film and uplifts the entire thing, including the fact that he got murdered, whereas Rex's FBI takes you out of the entire Toy Story movie and in the moment that they're sharing right now. Time. All right, over to Tim now for your 30 second rebuttal. When you think about Toy Story, your brain doesn't immediately go to Rex just because I think that short was made because he was such an underrated character. And again, you're talking about like Hector, like he's just this no, like whoever person. You already said he's the best character in the movie. He's on all of the posters. He's on the cover of the fucking Blu-ray, which people pick up to buy. He's everywhere throughout the movie and he has the best emotional arc throughout the movie, which makes him the best character, therefore not underrated. Rex is there in the background throughout the entire, all four uh, Toy Story films, just delivering funny moments that aren't just kid jokes. They're for adults as well. Time. He's hilarious. <sighs> that was uh, th that was in interesting. I'm I'm super torn. Uh, let's go to Cody. Uh, see who gets who gets his point. Hold on, my dog is trying to lick up all the water that remains in her in the freaking Lake of the Ozarks. Thank you, dog. Okay, um, now. Okay, um, I okay. One bold choice from Kim. Uh, hats off to the man. Uh, picking Rex. Wouldn't have thought about it. Hector, unconventional. Um, much because you think of that. I think, in my opinion, I think Coho sold me a little bit better on why Hector, Hector might be underrated. I think, I think Tim did a really good job of combating Hector. But then Caleb was able to shoot down Rex pretty well in my eyes. So I have to give it go. All right. Um, I'm surprised that it happened this late, but I actually disagree disagree with Cody. Um, <laughs> this is super torn. And I think Caleb had the right setup for, um, for getting the point in terms of the rebuttal. I just I needed to hear a line. I needed to hear a line that brought down one of, one of the films, and I just – didn't I know people give me shit, but like I need some substances if you're gonna say this this person did this. Give me something. I just didn't get that. So Tim narrowly gets that gets that point. Um but Doug, you're gonna break the tie for the first time this match. Who gets your point and why? Hey guys, I like being the tiebreaker. Help me. Uh no, uh so it was actually said pretty early in the, uh on in the arguments, uh what kind of one it for me off the bat because I didn't hear anything against it and Tim kept battering it in was that Hector is a mainstay of the of the story. He's one of the best parts of Coco. It's the part that you kind of fall in love with. Um, Caleb said it. Tim agreed and kind of kept pushing on that subject. Uh, so that's why I gave Tim the point. 
All right, then, ladies and gentlemen, that means that your winner and still the Nerdgasm champion is Tim the Hulk Ricala. Uh, final score of four to one. Uh, how how ironic that this is actually the same score of uh, of our, of the last championship match with Robert Parker. Uh, I was I believe it was four to one. Um, four up. Was four yeah. Oh, okay. I thought it was right. Right. We went to speed round. No. Okay. No. Uh, right. Robert won. He won one of them. I know he won one of the crap ones. It's fine. Anyways, let's the go. Harry Potter one. Oh, oh yeah. Right. All right. Let's go into uh, some post match interviews. Starting off with Tim. Uh, Tim, you looked pretty comfortable in this uh, in, in in this match match for the most part. I know Caleb is is really good at uh, as getting people pissed off, and I just I didn't quite get that from you. Um, how did you feel about your performance today? Oh, he pissed me off. Uh, he pissed me off a lot. If uh, if I hadn't gone into this knowing I was gonna, you know, like try to be more calm than I was in the last match, I would have er- erupted a lot more. Caleb likes to do this thing with his face where he goes and he, it makes you feel like the dumbest piece of shit ever. Where every moment that he I wasn't talking, I like muted and just went that motherfucker got fucking dead actually, and then just like came back in like really quickly. Um, but no, this was fun. Um, I knew I was gonna lose one of the two that Caleb picked. I didn't expect it to be the Marvel one. Um, after I won the Doctor Who question, I was honestly really surprised. That kind of got me on a good pace and a good set for the uh for the match so uh yeah definitely probably honestly like robert was a tough fight but this this was almost as if not more <coughs> than that fight so uh that was fun caleb Thanks. uh so one of the so i guess your your next your next defense will be one of will be one of the uh one of the new upcoming rookies that we have seen uh in season two with with the various various triple threats um, or it could be, uh, I think, yeah, this, this will be, yeah, this will, it will be, will be Robert. Um, how, uh, how do you feel? Would you rather go up against Robert again? Or are, are any of these new competitors giving you, uh, giving you an appetite for, uh, for competition? I'd rather go up against someone I haven't played before. Like, I think the easier fight would honestly be Robert because I've already done it. Um, and so like. I think Robert has the better chance of beating me, but as far as like being comfortable in the match or whatever, I think that playing Robert would be easier for me. The uh, but yeah, I'd rather play someone new that I haven't played before. That that's the end goal because uh, that that's always more fun. Um, so yeah, we'll see what happens. Um, I hope I get to play someone new, but if it comes down to Robert again, then sure, let's do it. All right. Uh, now I want to go over to over to Caleb. Um, Caleb, I think in terms of your style of debate, this is probably some of the some of the best work that we that we have seen in that in that realm. You're just going up and you're going up somebody against against Tim, who would honestly, in my opinion, it's a very very defensive, defense forward sort of sort of sort of debate style. He really he really tackles those counterpoints quite well. Uh, but how do you feel about your performance today? No one I've ever debated has had my number the way that Tim Bracala has. Um, every single person I debated, that whether it be Cody, whether it be I've actually never debated you as this as if this comes out. I think our debate might be up. I have no idea. But uh, when it comes to the people I fought, I've always had one or two questions where I won a point that I definitely should have, shouldn't have because of my tactics. Every point that I won tonight, all one of them, uh, was because of my actual argument. And I lost every point that I deserved to lose because Tim fucking kicked my ass. Tim was very good at being calm, and he owned me the entire match. Uh, the moment he won Doctor Who, uh, like, and I knew that I had lost it. Like, I had completely lost it on my own. Like, I fucked up, and I realized I'm probably gonna lose this fight. And I'm kind, I kind of made peace with that real quick because the way that Tim fights is very cool under pressure and whenever i got him to sort of crack a little bit i took that as a personal victory uh because he's very very chill and the reactions are how i'm able to gauge how i'm doing um so he did really well uh he won every point that he should have i would have given him the point on every single one that he won uh so i i, I applaud him uh and i'm kind of glad this is over <laughs> I'm kind of glad this is done. Uh, Tim is excellent. I actually would love to see Cody and Tim play because I think Tim could win uh, personally. Um, but you know, I think that'd be uh, I think that'd be a fun debate. But anyway, uh, congrats, champ. Uh, they always say they always say it's hard to win a title. It's harder to defend a title. So um, I think I know the answer to this question, but I'm going to ask it anyways. Yeah. Uh, 
what are we going are you going to try and venture back for, back venture back for that title does this make you sort of want to come kind of want to come back for it or you're like nope i've had my time i've had my time with tim this is uh oh I've, i'd always love to fight tim again uh i now that we've actually played i think strategies change i think questions change i think me and tim too would be a, an interesting fight probably closer uh because we both know how to expect and how to change our strategies a bit um but I think it'd be more interesting to see a rematch. I'd love to come back and play for a title again, but uh, that's not, it's not my goal at the moment. In fact, I think I'm probably just going to set my focus on just whenever you guys need me to come play, I'll come play someone and I'll, I'm not going to look to come back for the title, but if I make my way back to the title at some point, then cool. Um, but yeah, I mean, if I, if I play like a Doug Castle and end up winning that, and then I play a Brooklyn Bale and end up winning that and win three or four in a row and find myself playing Tim again, lovely. Uh, but I'm not, I'm not gunning for it again. So. All right. Well, well, uh, a great a great effort nonetheless. I think uh, I think I think get, get, getting here is, is is a task on its own. But then but then even like even to have to have that one point against him is 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 good is good. Uh, the score doesn't necessarily reflect reflect the performance in, in my opinion. Um, but we'll go over now to judges for their final thoughts. Doug, uh, championship championship match the fin- the finale of season two. Uh, how do you feel about the about the uh, match overall? No, I think they both did an incredible job. Regardless of what the score was, Caleb, you you came in fighting. Regardless, you're you're scrappy as hell. Uh, seriously, I, I said it during the Jay Burns match. You're scrappy, and that's what won you that match. Yeah, I'm um, scrappy and hungry, and I'm not throwing <laughs> away my shot. <laughs> All right, I guess we'll, we'll throw Hamilton references. But uh, Tim, I uh, kept this cool the entire time, and I, regardless of him saying, I took myself a camera to curse him out and come back and just be like, yeah. There's this and this and this. Uh, shows the kind of competitor that he is. It shows him that while even if something gets under his skin, he knows how to combat it, which is really a, a talent in debate. Uh, it was a it was an amazing map. Score doesn't re- you know doesn't reflect that. Uh, and Cody, uh, you're con- you're a connoisseur of debates uh, like the rest of the rest of the uh, rest of the panelists here on call. How do you feel about this match? Uh, I'm retired for the most part. Um, uh, TMG killed that uh, dream, um, but uh, uh, so oh, did I say that loud? Sorry, uh, sorry, I didn't mean to. I like Super Astro. I was going to watch this anyways, but if you do, uh, quit what you're doing. You're terrible. Um, but on that note, uh, Tim won. Tim's in the fellowship, so um, I w- I'm thoroughly happy for him. I don't know why anybody's shocked about this. Like I will say it to his face, like. You let the best champion in your league walk, and yeah, that's your own problem. But Tim is going to be – I don't think anybody will take Tim for a while. I don't think so. Uh, Tim is the closest to my style. Uh, Tim preps. Uh, Tim uh, knows what he's talking about. So, I mean, uh, hats off to him. He did a great job today. Uh, uh, Caleb, Caleb, Caleb played more of a reserve side of him. This time, and I think that's because he wants fandom to keep running next season. Um, this could have ended into a bloody war if Caleb was actually at full strength. Uh, he was about 60% of what I've seen him at. So I'm excited to see actually Caleb with a clean mind, not working like insane, crazy work hours, you know. Um, but I can't wait to see him actually back in the ring because I think he. Yeah, I think he held back a little bit tonight, and I want to see full Caleb because I think Caleb can be a champion in debate because he has the most unique style. Um, but Tim was able to just, no, nah, I'm not going to fall for your bullshit. Um, even when he threw fake movie news at him and Tim wanted to crush him for that false statement. So it was fun to watch. Uh, <coughs> congrats, Tim. Caleb, you'll probably be back in a couple months to, be, to probably get a motion. So, yeah, it's a great time. Uh, Cody wants to see full Caleb giggity. Um, so, uh, th- yeah, this is this this is a, this is a great match. Um, definitely an improvement of back and forth in terms of the, in terms of the last championship. I know that there's a there would be a, a, a pseudo sibling rivalry in, in that last one, so I can understand why things got heated. Um, I didn't need an aspirin for a coho match. This 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 is the first time. This this is great. I know the headache. I'm not stressed. I'm not tired. Like it, it was it was good. It was. It was re- like for the most part respectful. Like it was sportsman like, which is gen- which is generally what I, what, I, what I like to see see in debates. I mean, obviously Tim did did win with the final score of four one, but I do feel like there is a uh, 
there's a level of respect, but level of sportsmanship. Like you know, great match. Like we, I would love love to see this see this run again, regardless of the score. Um, but that is going to wrap it up for season for season two. Uh, this is the last nergasm of, of, of the year. Got to end it off on a championship. Uh, Tim getting to defend. So I do want to thank um, every competitor, every panelist that we that that we had, every judge that we had to come in. Um, Tim Bracala deserves a big old fucking thank you um, for editing the ma- for editing matches for like essentially reviving reviving the league because I I just I, I to be to be fruit to be truthful I just I don't have time I have I have too much on my plate at the moment so I had to diverge it off and thankfully Tim came in came in to help and like Cody and Caleb, Cody and Caleb for 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 helping out with the question writing and stuff. And Cody's quick to tell me uh, when a question is bullshit, and Caleb is really good at helping out. Well, this person knows this stuff here, um, and just the plethora of digits that we had: Caleb Bowman, Andrew Barr, Doug Castle, everybody. Just a massive thank you. Um, I think that uh, I have not given thanks uh, enough in the past, uh, and I've called it on that. And I need to really. Um, Really show thanks. So um, I do want to thank everybody for coming on for the for the great match, a great way to end season two. For Caleb, for our champion Tim, for Doug, for Cody, I'm the Black Thunder Brooklyn Vale. Uh, be sure to what the fuck are you talking? About? <laughs> <laughs> All right, guys, cheers, uh, and as always, drive safely. Drive safe. Right <laughs> oh. <laughs>